One of the outstanding programmes ever invented for television is undoubtedly MASH. Now in its tenth year, it shows no sign of dwindling popularity, nor does it show any decline in the sure literary style of it. One of my guests tonight is not just a star of the long-running series and may it run forever, but has often been writer, director and always creative consultant. He is Alan Alda. And talking about things well written, another of my guests has spent a lifetime establishing himself as one of Australia's most successful contemporary writers. He's at present working on an extraordinary true story of a German adventurer who saved 1,300 Jews from annihilation in Nazi death camps during World War II. He is Thomas Keneally. Another of my guests was once described in her school's yearbook as the most musical, most dramatic person in school. Class clown, exuberant, extremely talented, and nuts. At present, she's in Australia playing the part of Eva Perron in Evita, and she is Patti Lapone. The music on the show will, be fe will feature the very talented Miss Kerry Bedell. So that's the lineup Alan Alda, Thomas Keneally, Patti Lapone, and Kerry Bedell. Join me after the break to meet Alan Alda. <laughs> Welcome back. Now, my first guest has created a unique and enviable reputation for himself in the world of show business. As a founder of that marvellous series, MASH, he displayed his talents as an actor, and at the same time he wrote some episodes, directed others, and filled the role as creative consultant for the series. As actor, writer and director, he's won three Emmy Awards, the only person to do so. In between MASH times, he's made his own movies. The latest is The Four Seasons, which he wrote, directed and starred in. Ladies and gentlemen, Alan Alda. This is a bit different from the last time we met. Well, it's a different country, that's one thing. No, but the last time we met in Australia, we met in a toilet. Oh, that's right, yes. That's right. <laughs> I stood next yeah. to you in the stall, and you said, I've heard of research, but this is ridiculous. <laughs> I, I was uh, surprised to see you there. Uh, uh, you, do you, I mean, is that... I don't spend you, all my time there. you be there, found no. there? <laughs> <laughs> no, nothing so. Which, I mentioned there the list of things that you do, the, all the things you do in the, in the business. Which uh, came first in ambition terms, to be an actor or to be a writer? Uh, I wanted to be a writer from the time I was about eight years old. It was uh, later in life, when I was nine, that I wanted to be an actor. <laughs> <laughs> well, your father encouraged you because your father, in fact, was an actor himself. In the he very did. He month. encouraged me, and he also wanted me to be a doctor. He wanted me to... Uh, I don't mean to be a singing doctor or anything like that. He wanted me to... Be, although that's an interesting idea. Very know? good idea, yeah. Uh, uh, he, he wanted me to uh, not be in show business, but... Uh, but would take me around and I would perform with him. We would do Abbott and Costello routines at benefits and... Uh, things like that. Uh, so he was training me to be an actor at the same time he was asking me to be a doctor. So uh, I... He wanted you to have a responsible job, in other words. I, th I think he wanted to protect me from the, the hardship of the profession, and I understand that. I wish that for my children, too, although You're... two of them want to be actresses. Oh, that's right, of course. And two of them, in fact, uh, are in the movie that you That's right. Done. I wrote them parts. So I did exactly what my father did for me. You know? That's right. But, but then what, what problems do you have, then, with your children in a movie? I mean, what thoughts do you have about their, their career in acting? I mean, would it disappoint you terribly if they went on and and went through with oh, it? Oh, uh, not at all, no. I, I want them to do what uh, they want to do. I want them to be happy, I want them to be... And I want them to be good at what they do, so if that's what it's going to be, then I want them to be uh, experienced, and I want to try to pass on what I know to them, and that kind of thing. It was actually one of the nicest times of my life, uh, directing my own daughters in a movie. It was just... It was... But there must be problems involved. I mean, you can't get very hard with them, can you, or can you? Uh, yeah, because well, no harder than I would get with any uh, any performer. I, I I mean, you need to be tender in, with uh, with a performer because it's a, the, the creative act is a very uh, well. You're out in the wilderness together. Nobody really knows where anybody's going. You, you barely have a compass and a map, and and uh, so you can't be too tough on anybody, and you shouldn't be. But uh, on the other hand, I, you you have to rally people to do their best and. Uh, and they know that, and we've worked together before in, in other things. You say you don't have a compass and a map, but as a writer, I mean, surely the map is what you've written, which brings yeah. you on to the other point, is you're a writer. What's the starting point for you for a movie? Is it a, a phrase somebody says to you? Is it an incident in your own life, or what is it? You know, I think it is... Um, when I... When I in, in, the, in anything I write, I think it is... The starting point for me is what I care, what I find myself caring about more than anything else. Uh, during that period of my life. Mm. Uh, in the Four Seasons, which is about friendship, I had had a very rough 
time with a very close friend of mine. I had, he had done something that I didn't like, and I judged him for it very harshly, and it, it threatened the friendship. And we patched it up, but I thought about that so incessantly that I realized that friendship, close friendship, must be a very powerful force in my life. And I thought, well, if it is for me, maybe it is for everybody else, too, and, and wouldn't it be good to explore that? But I, I find I only can really work on something that I care so much about that I can't shake it. If I, if I start to think about it, I just can't uh, get rid of it easily. But then if somebody um, came forward and said, look, we've got a great idea for a movie and tried to sell it to a studio, friendship would be right down the list, wouldn't it, of the current uh, values, I suppose, today that, that people regard as being box office. I mean, friendship is not like today they say it was sex, violence, oh, yeah. you know, was spacecraft or whatever. Friendship would come somewhere way down the bottom of their list. So I wonder if you're deliberately swimming against the tide in this uh, I wasn't deliberately doing it. Uh, uh, I, I, I don't know. I, see, I really don't think I could... Uh, I don't think I could be successful writing something um, to order in terms of uh, commercial um, qualities. Uh, I, I think that the only thing I can do is follow my own intu intuition, my own inspiration. And, and then I have a chance of doing something commercial. Well, the fact is, you're right. The friendship is uh, not only at the bottom of everybody's list, it's sort of off the page somewhere, because right. movies don't get made about friendship. Right. And yet, uh, here's this picture with this unconventional subject that people are standing in line all over America to see. So uh, I, I, mean, I hope they like it in, in this country and other countries as well. But uh, so far, it, the, so far, people seem to be um, as deeply interested in it as I am. And it's a comedy and it's entertaining, so I, 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 I'm not trying to uh, 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 bore anybody with a, with a, a you know, a portentous subject. I'm trying to, trying to be entertaining about a subject that we all are, are, are moved by. Because what interests me about this is, is the more I write about it, the more I think about it and talk about it, the more I realize that we cannot escape friendship. That's what's so weird about it. And when we try to accomplish friendship, we find it almost impossible because we're all so different and so solitary. We all have these sort of like horny toads, you know, we have these porcupine things that, that prevent us from getting too close without poking the other person in the eye. Well, let's go and have a look at a clip now, Alan, from your movie, which in, in fact displays that, actually. It's uh, the scene on the, on the yacht when they've all gone on holiday together. And yeah, it's where, the thing where about they're all cramped together on a boat and together. can't bear each other's company and after all a while. That's, that's right. Here we are. Oh, my God. The coffee ready? I can't get my eyes open this morning. Come here, this will get your eyes open. <laughs> They're swimming already? Where did they get the energy? Ah, keep looking. What am I supposed to see? Aha. <laughs> What's the matter? Is everybody sick? <laughs> Oh, my God. You know, when you really think about it, there isn't anything sexual about it. It's natural. People go to their doctor's offices, they take off their clothes. It doesn't mean a thing. Meanwhile, he hasn't taken his eyes off her for a second. Hi! 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 Oh, they're swimming over. Oh, oh, Lord. Just that casual. What, you mean like you? I'm going to make breakfast. I don't want to look at my friends naked. It makes it hard to have dinner with them later. I'm going to go sit in the shade. And I think maybe I'll read a book. OK, Danny, we've all got something to do. What's everybody getting so crazy about? You can't see anything. Then what are you standing there for? He's hoping she'll turn over and do the backstroke. In an episode like that, is, is it that again autobiographical? I oh, mean, that I never, that never happened to me. No. Sadly. No, no, I would have been too embarrassed. I would have been as embarrassed as the people in the movie. Uh, no, I, some of it, some of the, th some of the things in the movie have happened to me and some to friends that I've observed and some I just made up. Mm. 
And how much of yourself do you put into a movie, in the sense of how much do you work out a predicament of your own in the movie? For instance, there's a quote. One of the characters says, I go to bed every night on an ache you wouldn't believe. This is the depressed guy, the guy who's worried about middle age and, and all that sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, well, I've gone to bed on an ache from time to time. So, yeah, that, although this poor man suffers from a fear of death that is so <laughs> extraordinary that, uh, that uh, thank goodness, I've never been through that. Uh, I mean, he's, uh, he's afraid of everything, this, this mm. guy. But... Uh, there's a little bit of me in all of the characters. I mean, I, enough enough of me so that I can understand what those characters are going through. I think that's the only way to uh, uh, to make them breathe. You know, to, to know that somebody has gone through something like that. Mm. Now we see you now as an exceedingly successful man. I mean, success in the movies, success, of course, in 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 Mash, everything working for you. But what, in fact, was the most depressing aspect of your life when you were coming up uh, through the business? I mean, what kind of jobs did you do to keep body and soul together? Well, you know, it's interesting. I, I did a lot of uh, very uh, th things very unrelated to show business, but th it never depressed me. I don't remember ever being depressed by it. I had this wonderful uh, pluck as a, as a young actor, uh, even though I was working as a doorman and a cab driver, uh, I colored baby pictures. I was a clown. I was a clown at the openings of gas stations and chicken parts stores. Really? Yes. Uh, what did I, it involve I, doing? I, it, it involved giving out balloons. And I remember giving out balloons to kids at 103rd Street and Broadway in New York, which is Dope City. Um, and the kids there are kind of tough. I mean, they, they, they're, they're armed all the time, these children, you know. And they, and they wanted balloons from me. And I, when I started to run out, they chased me up a light pole. <laughs> <laughs> and I was a paid subject for hypnosis in a psychiatric clinic. Uh, really? Made $25 out of that. It was a very interesting experience. What did they do with you there? They hypnotized me. But, but, but then, I mean, <laughs> Which is all right. That's what they said they were going to do. You know. But what uh, conclusion did they come to after the hypnotized? <laughs> <laughs> it was a test to find out if, you would, uh, if your uh, autonomic nervous system was more efficient under hypnosis. And, uh, what uh, does autonomic nervous system uh, mean? That part of your, your nervous system which is not under your conscious control. And one, and one of the ways they tested that was to see if you would uh, be able to read words flashed at a thousandth of a second, if you could read them faster under hypnosis. But th they made the mistake of showing them to me uh, without hypnosis and then with hypnosis. And of course, being an actor, I had them all memorized the second time. So I recognized every one of them. You know, it's, it's, so it's 25 bucks for you and nothing for them, that's really. That's right. Well, I figured that was a good, uh, good bargain, you know, that's <laughs> good right. trade. All right, we'll be back in a moment. Take a break now, back in a moment to talk but some I more. I need a rest after that. You knew you need yes, a rest, of course. Back in a moment after this break. See you soon. Alan, um, we talked there a bit, little bit before the break about the unsuccessful part of your life. Um, MASH was obviously very, very important to you. Yeah. How important was it? Well, it was a big, uh, big, big boost for me. I, I, I learned so much in the ten years that I've been doing MASH. Uh, I've, I've developed as a writer and a director and as an actor. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm better at all of those than I was before. And, uh, and, and, and even better than that, I've, I've I, I think I've developed a relationship with the audience so that uh, now, now that the Four Seasons comes out, I only have to say it's a comedy and it has some serious moments in it, and they know that they can relate that to some, a, yeah. kind, of, a kind of work they've seen on MASH where we're serious sometimes and, and funny at other times, antic at other times, and, uh, and you don't have to start from scratch then, you know, although it's an entirely different story, but, but the mix of, of uh, funny and, and, uh, and some serious is, uh, is one that represents, for me, the best kind of comedy. And I'm glad that uh, people, uh, to some extent, have come to uh, expect that from me, because that's what I would love to be able to do uh, the rest of my life. Let's have a look at that little clip, because you raised the matter there, that sort of blend there is, that unique blend in, in, in MASH of the serious and the... I want, to, I, want to, I want to thank you for, for playing that clip. I didn't know you were going to play that. And, uh, and there, it's a special uh, moment for me right now because that was a show that I wrote and directed. And the other two actors in it are my father and my brother. And it's very nice for me to sit here and, and see the three of us acting together. Yeah, and yeah. and that, it's, it's a very nice, it's not, we did it uh, two or three years ago. And, and I, uh, 
I love seeing it again. Thank you. Do you have uh, any, did you have any reservations about uh, MASH when it was first offered to you? Because um, I think I'm right in saying that, in fact, you were in the army for a spell and it made you into a pacifist, didn't it? Yeah, I can't imagine that it wouldn't everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Those who were left, anyway, you know. Yeah, right. uh, uh, I, uh, yeah, I had some reservations, uh, not reservations, I had fears. It was, it was the best, I had no reservations, it was the best pilot I'd ever seen. But um, I was afraid it might be uh, a commercial for the army, it might, or that it might be, uh, look like hijinks at the front, you know, right. Abbott and Costello meet the Korean War. And I, I was really afraid of that. And uh, I didn't agree to do it until 2 o'clock in the morning, bef the night before we started the work on the, on the first episode, the pilot episode, because uh, we were still talking until 2 in the morning about how, what approach we would take. Would we actually show the war as the kind of place it is, which is a place of uh, utter brutality and harm and hurt, and, uh, and not ever show it to be fun? And, I, and I, uh, we've, we've all tried to do that all the way through. Do you have to lean back? I mean, that's, I mean, that's fine as a concept, but of course, uh, you've got the other thing to care about, what well, the network has, which is the commercial aspect of it. Have you had any battles with them about how far you can go in depicting the real brutality, the real horror of what it's all about? We, do, we, te we tend not to have any battles at all. We, we really try to, to, to collaborate as much as we can. Uh, you know, in our country, I can't remember if... See, it's interesting. We keep the uh, there's a laugh track on the show, but we keep it so low that it's hard to tell sometimes whether it's there. I don't know whether you see the show here with a laugh track. We have to have a laugh track, a, a mechanical, a machine that makes laughter. You know, yes. it's really it's a degrading experience. But we, uh, uh, we have this uh, mechanical laughter on our show, and uh, we've asked not to have it, but we must have it. So we uh, sort of swallow that. We we they didn't want us to show too much uh, blood. Uh, we showed a, a little bit more than they ever wanted, uh, not as much as you would really see in a, in a real uh, uh, field hospital. Uh, we have never been able to show, to hear the moans of the wounded, and, and maybe they're right about that. I mean, maybe you'd, you simply wouldn't be able to switch back and forth between the laughter and the, and the, uh, and the serious stuff if the serious parts were, were so full of, of suffering. Uh, although I know every time I direct a scene in which the wounded are coming in, I, I know that we're violating reality to some extent. Although I, what I do is I try to have them uh, uh, portrayed as uh, unconscious as they come in. So, because if they were conscious, they wouldn't just be laying there saying, oh, ooh, ooh, ow, you know. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's, it's awful. It's an awful experience. And I'd like to get the, as much of the real texture of it as possible. Talking about suffering on a personal level, of course, you had your fair share of that as a child, didn't you? Because you had polio when you were very young, didn't you? Yes, when I was seven. Yeah. Yeah. seven. How were you uh, cured of that? Uh, through the treatments uh, discovered by Sister Kenny, your Australian nurse. Well, it's not yours. Uh, not no, my Australian nurse. No, no. no. They're Australian. One's Australian nurse, yeah. Uh. Uh, um, she... Uh, I've, I've, uh, I've, I'm very impressed by Sister Kenny because not only did she in, invent this uh, treatment, which saved my life and the lives of millions of other kids, uh, but she was told for 20 or 30 years to keep quiet and, uh, and, and not tell anybody about her treatment. She was told this by the, the medical establishment at the time, which was all male. And uh, uh, they, one doctor said, doctors have nothing to learn from nurses. And, uh, <laughs> And if he had been allowed to be right, if he had been allowed to keep her quiet, if she had allowed him to do that, she didn't. She fought. She said, I don't care. I'm going to get this out to the, to the world. Well, if, if, uh, if that man had, uh, had been allowed to do that, I'd be dead now, probably. And, uh, well, how badly were you affected? Well, I was affected all over my body, except, uh, I think, my left arm. And, really? and I, would, I would either be dead or paralyzed. And, and, uh, and there are millions of kids who, who died during those 20 years when she was not. I mean, when a, a treatment comes up that saves lives and people say, no, we're not going to listen to you because you're a woman, that's insanity. And, and, the, uh, and my feeling is that that is not the first time that's happened in the world. It's not th the last time either. It's happening now because we're keeping women out of the workforce because of sexual stereotyping. I think it's, I've had a personal experience that makes me know how costly that can be. Uh, I, I wish that uh, the rest of us would wake up to that. Let's go to back to, to, to in a moment. What, what was this treatment that, that she... Well, it's kind of, it's kind of a, it's, it's, thank God it saved my life, but it's a, sort of uh, inconvenient while you're going through it. They, they wrap you in hot uh, blankets that have been steamed in a pressure cooker, or cooked in a pressure cooker, or something, I don't know, not a pressure cooker, but a double boiler, so that they're not actually scalding, but it's a good impersonation of scalding. <laughs> and, uh, 
they uh, wrap you uh, all over where you're affected, and uh, every hour they do that, uh, whether you want it or not. And then they, uh, they pull on your muscles and stretch them, uh, physiotherapy, bend everything back. Uh, as a result, I have this, uh, this uh, ability to, um, I, I can extend my leg like a dancer now, and, and with no, I mean, most people, I can put it way up to there. Uh, well, put it right up there. Well, I, well. I, uh, <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Like, actually, that's a little Australian trick that I got from Sister Kitty. But, uh, uh, that's, uh, I mean, that's the extent to which they stretch your muscles because the, the disease is one of, um, of um, what do you call it, uh, uh, spasm. The, the muscles go into extreme spasm and, and stay that way, and it's so badly so that the bones begin, begin to, uh, to uh, grow out of shape. And, uh, it's a very, very uh, serious disease. Now, the, all of this, this treatment, of course, occurred before the uh, the vaccine was was discovered by Saul. Was the only alternative? Yeah, so that if you didn't have this, you had nothing. Right. Now this, of course, then this obviously stayed with you and your debt to this woman, and that's had something to do, one imagines, with the the right that you've become well known for, or the women's rights issue that you become. Well I don't. Known. I don't really know if there is that connection because I didn't really understand this, uh, how much I owed Sister Kenny and how much I owed her, her uh, willingness to fight for her right to be heard uh, until a couple of years ago. I mean, I finally put two and two together. I, I think it had to do with the fact that my parents brought me up to be fair. Uh, in the 50s, I read Simone de Beauvoir and was very impressed. You know, when she was talking about, in, in, the, in the second sex, uh, when de Beauvoir talked about, about sexual stereotyping, I recognized what she was talking about because I realized that it had happened to me. Not that, not, <laughs> My first inclination was not to realize that I was guilty of stereotyping, which I later realized. My first realization was that I had been stereotyped. I had been told, if you don't behave a certain way, you're not welcome in our sex. You know, you have to play football, you have to be willing to hit people over the head, and <laughs> you, know, uh, you have to want to kill animals and things. And I, and, uh, I tried that, and I didn't like it too much. <laughs> yeah. Might this be the subject of a movie you do? Hmm? Might this be the subject of a movie that you do? Uh, it's a good story. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's certainly something I think about a lot, isn't it? And that's mm. the, good, um, the good criterion. That's the one I follow. Mm. Well, why don't we talk later? All right. <laughs> what, about, what about the future, then? You've got the Four Seasons now, which is yeah. doing very well. What, what are the plans? Another series of MASH? Yes, uh, we're going to do the 10th year of MASH uh, starting in a couple of months. Yes. And then uh, do you have another movie in mind? Well, I have two more movies uh, to make for Universal, uh, in which I'm supposed to write, direct, and act. And uh, it can be uh, on any subject I want. I can write anything I want, so I'm very happy about that. The, uh, the only thing that's uh, sort of exciting about it is that I have no idea what to write about. That's right. <laughs> so I, I, really, I really am excited by that. It's, there's a sense of discovery about it. You know, I talked a minute ago about uh, the creative process being one where you're sort of out in the woods by yourself alone. And uh, it's like being an explorer to a certain extent. You, uh, if, if you only write about what you already know, that's not creative so much. That's just sort of rearranging the previously known and, and uh, uh, there's a certain amount of craft in that, but not art, I don't think. And, and, and the other stuff, reaching out for what you don't know about is uh, hair-raising because you always know you can fail. You can always fall off the high wire, you know, to, to, to mix a few me metaphors together. But, uh, but uh, the excitement of, of possibly getting something that's never been seen before is, is uh, intense, and I guess it's the, it's the carrot that keeps us going. There, I threw another metaphor in. That's, no, that's right, you keep yeah. mixing them beautifully. Yes, thank uh, you. Yeah. Well, it's a, a metaphorical cocktail you've just uh, dispensed. A, a soup. <laughs> a soup, uh, yes, a soup. Well, we'll discuss this later on, no doubt, with Mr. Thomas Keneally, but for the moment, Alan Alder, thank you very much indeed. Alan thank Alder. you. We're back. After the break, for a song from Kelly Bidell. See you after this break. In the 70s, my next guest looked set fair for international stardom as a singer. She went to Vegas and then walked away from her glittering career. She contented herself working as a backing singer and then formed her own jazz rock band. The group's now disbanded, but she's at present forming a new group, which will debut in August, which is the good news. The better news, however, is that she's in the studio to sing a song made famous by Barbara Streisand. The title, Have I Stayed Too Long at the Fair? The singer, Miss Kerry Bidell. <laughs>
My next guest is a bit of an all-rounder. He's acted in two movies, The Devil's Playground and The Chant of Jimmy Blacksmith, which he also wrote. It's as a writer he's best known, with an international reputation based on his 16 novels. His latest project is the extraordinary true story of a German adventurer who saved Jews from gas chambers in concentration camps. Ladies and gentlemen, Thomas Keneally. <laughs> One thing about your writing, generally speaking, is you cover a huge range of interests and, and subjects. Where, in fact, do you get the initial inspiration from? Well, it, it varies, but in this case, uh, I went to buy a bag in a store in Beverly Hills, and the man wouldn't let me out virtually till I'd promised to, to write the book. Uh, writers are always meeting people who say, uh, I know a man who's very big in women's underwear and you've got to write a book about uh, the women's underwear business. But this <laughs> man said, I am one of 1,300 Jews who was saved by an extraordinary German called Oskar Schindler, who was a bon vivant, an industrialist, a wild man, a briber, a corrupter of SS officials, and uh, I'm one of the people he saved. And he said to his son, Freddy, mind the shop. He got a load of documentation out of his back office. He took it up to the local bank, which are open on Saturdays in America. And he got it all copied. And he said, go to your hotel. I'll get your book. 
and we'll read it, my lawyer and I will read it overnight if we like your sort of writing. We'll come along and see you tomorrow and see if you're interested in the material. Well, I, well, I was uh, very interested in the material, but that's not generally the way it happens. Generally, you, you get a... I, I don't know how it happens. You, you hear an, um, about an incident or you get a mad idea um, that seems okay when you're drinking with friends and talking about writing. It's wonderful to talk about writing. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, it's the great thing. Uh, um, it's the only consolation a writer has. And, and uh, when you're with friends, and uh, even now, writing seems terribly e easy. But, uh, yes, anecdotes, uh, stray thoughts. Um, well, let's go on to, on to Schindler. We've got a photograph of Schindler, I think. Let's, let's have a look at him. That's yeah. him there. On the left-hand side, talking to an SS officer. Now, yes. you said now he saved these Jews from concentration camps. We'll talk about the detail in a moment. But, in fact, of course, and that sounds a saintly thing to do. He's far from being a saint. Yes, he was a, a wild man. He was um, involved in the black market in Poland. He was... Um, uh, as all his, um, uh, the women folk whom he saved, who now live all over the world, as they say, he was um, uh, absolutely charismatic and he had um, a, a series of love affairs. And they all say, thank God, he was more faithful to us than he was to his wife. And um, uh, he was uh, an enormous drinker. He, he's, one of his stratagems was to uh, get the SS drunk. Well, it was the first recourse. L let's talk first of all, then. No, no, let's to get the story absolutely straight. Now, how on earth did he manage in, in occupied Poland to get these people out of concentration camps? What was his tactic? Well, he began in occupied Poland as a, an industrialist. He had an enamel works and a tank shell factory. And... He got. He didn't go there to get involved with the the Jews, but he he got, uh, um, for better for want of a better word, he he got very involved with a couple of extremely intelligent um, Jewish accountants and in, and industrialists whose businesses had been taken away from them, right. and he began to employ Jews who were in trouble. Um, in his factory. And when the ghetto was founded, he went on employing them, he took more in. And when he saw what was happening in the ghetto, uh, the terrible actions where the son, uh, SS would go through the streets that were as familiar to the people as, who lived in them as, as the streets of Sydney are to us, and they would drag women out and, and shoot them, they would dash babies ac against the wall, they would would put the old people on trucks for Belzettes where they'd be gassed. Belzettes was just down the road. It was like Gosford to, to, to us. And um, uh, when he saw what was happening, he got the idea of founding his own concentration camp in which people would be safe. And that's virtually what he did. And when the Russians got close and the SS said, we're going to kill everyone in the camps in the Krakow area, we're going to kill everyone in Parshov and in all the sub camps, uh, he took them to Czechoslovakia and founded another camp where they remained safe till the end of the war. And what sort the, of... Um, we've got a picture here, actually, of the camp, I think. Uh, that's that's, right. that's Parshov camp. You, you know, there are people in, in Sydney and Melbourne. M most of the Schindler Juden, as they call themselves, the Schindler Jews, live in, in Israel. And a lot of them live in New York and Los Angeles. But there are people in Australia who haven't seen a picture of Oscar or a picture of that horrible camp, Plashov, from which Oscar rescued his people since they left it in 1945. And they, I, who was the commandant in charge of that camp? Well, the commandant in Plashov was a terrible man, same age as Oscar, uh, called Armon Gert. There we are. He there. used to shoot people from his balcony with a high-powered rifle. He... Um, um, th there's, there is a man in Sydney, for example, who worked as a prisoner in Gert's office. And one day he brought in a, a pile of uh, building requisition forms and Gert was signing them. And there was a 20-year-old kid across the road, out the window, they could see this 20-year-old kid urinating. Gert said, excuse me, put down the papers, went and got his revolver and shot the kid through the head. That's the sort of man Armin Gert was. And as you say, people now in Australia would, be, would know Seeing that man. Gert, see they they'd know Gert and he would send chilled through their body. There's no doubt about that. 
What sort of people did he <coughs> save, the survivors? I mean, what, what kind of people are they now? He, uh, well, they're, they're generally uh, ex extremely successful um, in, in business. Um, one of them is a millionaire in West Germany, for example. Uh, what, another is um, as an Israeli Supreme Court judge. Uh, Oscar was a great man for black marketeering. And in fact, he managed to transfer an SS officer in April 45, an SS officer who was charged with exterminating all the people in Oscar's camp. He forged papers with the help of this young man, who is now an Israeli Supreme Court judge, forged papers to transfer the Commandant to the Eastern Front. <laughs> when, when the Commandant arrived at the Eastern Front, the, the Colonel of the regiment said, uh, these papers are forged. And he said, well, I'll go back. And the Colonel said, no, you won't. We need you. And the, the prisoners then took over the camp in the last days of the war with weapons that Oscar had, A, bought from the Czechoslovak underground, and B, conned out of the local poli uh, SS police chief of Brunn in Czechoslovakia. When did he die, Oscar? Uh, his later life is fascinating because he came rather, became rather dependent on the people he'd saved. Uh, he was their, their father, a woman in Tel Aviv, Tel Aviv said, who was saved by him. I nearly said television. Um, a woman in Tel Aviv said he was our mother, he was our father, he was our only faith, he never let us down. And yet, after the war, he didn't make a go of anything. He was subject to some pressure from the Odessa because he, he gave evidence against a number of German war criminals. And um, he had a weakness for the bottle. And he split up with his wife. He ran a farm in Argentina, and that went bust. He had a cement works in Frankfurt. And he became dependent on the people he'd saved, the way a, a father does uh, eventually become dependent on his children. And um, he used to live like, I suppose, like a king in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, six months of the year, from around about 1965 until the time he died in 74. And he's buried on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. Now, you went around and you interviewed all the survivors, as many as you could. You went to Poland, you sure, went to yes, Israel and yes. all over, and you've got this first draft written now. But what sort of feeling did it give you to unearth that kind of horror? It's one thing to read about. It's another thing to experience yes, it at yeah. first hand. To stand in a street in Krakow with, with the man from the baggage store who wouldn't held me in his, in his teeth like, a, like a, a, a bloodhound once he had hold of me. Um, he went with me to Poland. And <clears throat> to stand in an ordinary street, and he said to me, this is the the gate behind which I hid during the day they were liquidating the ghetto. And I saw three officers come round the corner with dogs, and the dogs went in and dragged a mother and child out in, into the street. And the mother had been hiding with her child um, and hadn't obeyed orders and lined up and got on the trucks. And he said, I saw the, ki the child killed instantly in front of my eyes, 100 meters away. And I saw the woman shot. And um, to stand in a, in a street that looks quite ordinary and have someone tell you, this is where it happened. This is where the innocents were slaughtered. And to realize that these people were, Krakow was, was a little city. It was as f very familiar, lovely, must have been a lovely city to grow up, uh, up in until Hitler arrived. And all these people knew each other. The, the cases where relatives would would be going through the right recycled clothing that the SS sent to these camps, the the clothing of the dead, um, and they'd find uh, their their aunt's dress and their mother's dress, and in one case, the the shoes of a three-year-old niece, and to know that it happened and was as real to them as the things that happened to us is quite startling because I, in Australia, there aren't many, uh, aren't many Central European Jews. There aren't many people that have been through the Holocaust. There are more than I ever thought. But I grew up without uh, meeting uh, anyone Jewish. And to find out how real it is, is uh, for a Gentile, is an astonishing thing. 
Well, well, may I ask you something? How, how do you feel about what about the uh, in the light of all of that, the uh, this uh, incredible uh, effort now on the part of some people to try to to uh, prove that it never took place. Right? Sure. That, that yeah. This, this yeah. so-called research that's coming out now that that tries to contradict the historical fact mm -hmm. of this this uh, atrocity, this this wave of atrocities. What uh, what's your response to that? Well. I've got no doubt it happened now because yeah. everyone I talk to, their whole family's gone. Oh, I don't think there's any Because there are 5,000 Jews in, in Poland when they used to be nearly 4 million, and some of them are in Los Angeles and New York and Sydney, certainly, but, but not many. And I, I uh, have been told, and I'm quite sure it's true, that the people in Los Angeles, there's a, a, a man, in, uh, a professor at uh, uh, University of Southern California, whose father was in the German uh, army and in, was in the SS, actually, who is leading a revisionist um, uh, group who are trying to prove that this never happened. And he's taking a tour of people to Auschwitz and to Dachau. Uh, I have it on pretty good authority that there, is, there are great sums of money available, inevitably, from the Arab lobby to support scholars who attempt to show that the Holocaust never occurred. Mm. And I think it's very likely, uh, because the, a, a great part of the Israeli, is, uh, the Israeli appeal to the world in general I is see. the fact that they were beaten up in this way during the war. And um, I'm quite sure it's probably the truth. But what view does it give you of the, <coughs> of the, <coughs> the Jews to start with? I mean, a lot of people said that uh, you know, one of the <laughs> terrible things about it was they went almost complacently to their death. Sure, I mean, did you have yeah, any insight yeah. into, into that? Uh, yes, I am uh, convinced of two things. By the time they got, if you were an individual Polish or Estonian or Russian Jew, by the time you got to the lip of that trench where they were going to pile you in on top of the other bodies, by the time you got to the door of the chamber, you had been fed for years on uh, a frightfully inadequate diet. You had no physical strength left. And you came from a race which for centuries had used a policy in dealing with civil authorities. And the policy was bribe them if you can, talk them out of the worst things they're going to do, confer with them. Can I finally ask you as well that, I mean, um, you've got the two things here, haven't you? You've got the, the conflict of all that horror that happened. You've got within all that, you've got that immense bravery of one man who, who helped people against yeah. all the odds. Yeah. When you put the two together, and you, which you've done, as in you, researching this book, I mean, what are you left with? Uh, what feeling about the human condition? Is it one of horror or is it one of... No, I, I, uh, I don't get amazed when people are, um, are, are vicious. Uh, I, I'm the sort of human that, and I hope it will always remain this way, although I haven't suffered anything like these people. Uh, I, I take the attitude now that it's a miracle when people are heroic. And it is astonishing how many people did take risks in this situation. Oscar took spectacular risks, but there were other people taking risks along with him. His secretary, his mistress, his wife, mm. um, various SS officers who had become disgusted with what was happening. and. Um, they're the people who are the, the hope of humanity, and they're the people who are amazing. It, it, it doesn't... When you've got an e immense governmental organisation, an immense propaganda machine telling people that it's OK to, to shoot Jews, uh, the people who stand out are amazing. Mm. They're like the people who... Um, uh, when something is is uh, bombarded at the public in television commercials, they're like the people who don't buy it. <laughs> so it's a story in the end of, of hope. We look forward to reading yes. it. Thomas Keneally for the moment. Thank you very much indeed. Thomas Keneally. Back in a moment to meet the star of Evita, Miss Patty Lapone. We'll see you after this break. <laughs> Welcome back.
There was little doubt that my next guest would make a living out of show business. She's been on stage since the age of four. Her great aunt was the legendary opera star Adeline Patty, and her school yearbook described her as the most musical, most dramatic person in school, exuberant, extremely talented, and nuts. She became a major star when she played Eva Perron in the Broadway production of Evita, a performance which won her the award as Best Actress in a Musical. At present, she's in Sydney, appearing in the Australian production of Evita. And before we meet her, let's see and hear, hear her in the part that made her into a star. Many people have sung Don't Cry For Me, Argentina, but few with the dramatic intensity of Miss Patti Lupone. I said too much. There's nothing more I can think of to say to you. But all you have to do is look at me to know that every word is Gentlemen, Miss Patty Lupone. How are you? It's very dramatic, <laughs> isn't it? That yes. it's astonishing. Yeah. How real is the emotion when you sing something like that? Well, it's. I'm, I'm a transparent actress. A director once told me when I'm good, I'm good. When I'm bad, I stink. <laughs> and it's true. It's true. Audiences can see the difference. Um, so it's real. It has to be, otherwise they, they can see the difference. But how do you project yourself into, into that kind of emotion? What do you do? I concentrate on uh, each moment. And if I've done my work properly beforehand, then the emotion is free and real. And I can't be fooling around backstage. In other words, before I go on, I have to remember it's, it's Don't Cry For Me, Argentina. I'm supposed to cry. The director has directed me to cry at this particular point. And uh, I try not to force the tears. 
Uh, if they don't come, they don't come, but generally if I work moment to moment truthfully, the emotion will be there. And actually that's the only way for an actor to work to be truthful. It's, so it's the part, therefore, that you're playing and not just kind of a false image you put in your mind to make you cry. Well, you know. yes, there's a thing in acting called substitution, but I don't really rely on that too often because if you think about your dead dog, yeah. chances are the emotion will be your dead dog and not, you know, ruling Argentina. Yeah. Don't you agree with that, though? Yeah. I, I, have, I, I work the same way I, I, on, on what the circumstances of the the present play are and not done something in the past. Yeah, yeah it do, it, I find it doesn't work, it, yes. uh, the substitution, yes. because it's the wrong emotion and, yeah. and the audience can be, become confused, mm. so. Tom, of course, you acted. Could you briefly sum up your acting career? <laughs> yes, the, uh, just to say it's in doubt. It's in doubt. <laughs> 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 That sums up everybody's acting career. Oh, sure. <laughs> now, let's talk a little bit about this part that you play, because everybody says it is one of the most physically demanding parts ever, ever written. Would you go along with that? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, but uh, how? In what way? Well, I have done uh, a play that is emotionally as difficult as Evita, and I've done a musical that is physically as difficult as Evita, but Evita employs the emotions, the technique of having to dance a ridiculous number, the choreography is, is, is so complicated. And then the sheer stamina of the singing mm. of it, which uh, I'm a soprano, and it's a, it's a mezzo role. So it's, in fact, too low for my voice. And I had a wonderful teacher who taught me not to hit the bottom notes because I'll sacrifice my high notes. And he also said, the audience will forgive you your low notes. They will not forgive you your high notes. And it's quite true. And also, where Andrew Lloyd Webber wrote the uh, score for the woman is is in a pretty dicey area. All her average notes are in the passaggio, which is the weakest, was the weakest part of my voice. So there was a fear every night, am I going to get through this part? Okay, I got through that part. Am I going to get through this part? Mm. So it's a continual sort of hurdle, hurdle Plus after the, hurdle. Yes. Mm. Oh, absolutely. The mm. first 20 minutes of the show, if you get through that, can you get through the next 20? <laughs> That's seriously how I, I started the production. And then the emotional quality. She dies of cancer every single night. And it's, it's, it's true, you know, I, I look like a dog after the show and I, you know, people come into the dressing room and say, uh -huh. and it's, you know, it's, it's hard emotionally to... Uh, how, do you, how do you protect yourself then to, for, for the part every night? Well, I, I, I don't speak for 12 hours during the day. From when I stop speaking at night, I give myself 12 hours vocal rest. At first I thought I was being a... a a bit crazy, but then I read an article that Placido Domingo, uh, an interview, and no opera singer uh, speaks on the day of performance, because when we speak, we have a tendency to strain our voice right. before, we're not sitting up properly, we're not remembering the proper alignment of the voice, and I'm an Italian, and all my emotion sits right here in my throat, so if I, if I do this before the show, chances are I go on strained. Yeah. So 12 hours vocal rest, and then a good solid physical and speech and articulation warm up so that all the, it's an opera, all the words are understood, the audience is not being cheated in that respect. Right. And uh, a physical, a uh, good physical warm up because you, it's a rake stage. Do you find it very difficult to, to keep silent for 12 hours, being Italian? Well. <laughs> so meet another Italian. Huh? What, what is your name? <laughs> Alfonso D'Abruzzo. That's oh, right. No, it is. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for real, yeah. Yeah. That's my name. And but you I, changed it? I didn't. My father did when he was 18. He took A.L. from Alfonso and D.A. from D'Abruzzo and made Aldo, which also sounds Italian, so it's still okay. Yeah. But, uh, but, it, but that's a little more pronounceable. Mm. But, but I have the same thing. My, my emotions reside in my, right my throat, and I never thought of that as, uh, as an Italian uh, tendency, but I guess you're right. Well, right. in my family it was. My, my Uncle Bud doesn't have a voice anymore. <laughs> <laughs> He's really emotional. <laughs> what, about, what about this uh, great, was a great, great aunt you had? Was it Adelina yes, Patti? Yes, Adelina Patti. That's what? where my first name comes from, That's P-A-T-T-I. Right. So she was, she was one of the great legendary opera Color stars. Coloraturas, yes. yes. A diva. Yes. Yes, she was, um, she was notorious. Uh, she was constantly giving farewell performances. <laughs> and, uh, there are one or two people in the business nowadays who name that as well. <laughs> her husband was caught measuring, she invented name above title, and her husband was caught measuring the size of Adelina Pade next to the size of Puccini. You know, he was on a ladder measuring the, uh, she would never attend rehearsal, she'd send her maid to tell the people what she'd be doing. Really? Yeah, but her maid had a great voice. <laughs> <laughs> you just send the maid along yeah. to stand in. Me? No, no, send the maid along. Yes, to tell, well, to tell the chorus and to tell the other principals what she would be doing. <laughs> yeah. 
Now, you've done, of course, a lot of musicals, haven't you? Or quite a few musicals. Well, I, I knew I could sing very young, and I knew that my career would... Uh, coming from Long Island, New York, so close to the Broadway stage, I figured, well, you know, I'll make my fortune on the Broadway stage. And I discovered that I could sing, and I started dancing quite young. And then I went to Juilliard because I wanted to complete my training. But so I was in a few in high school, then a few at Juilliard. Then when I graduated with a degree in, and my training was in classical theater, we're all doing musicals now. Um, so I've done three, um, three before Evita. Well, one that I, I, I did not know of and never heard of before that you were in was called The Robber Bridegroom. Yes. I it's... never heard of The Robber Bridegroom. What was that like? Well, it's a, it's a novella by Eudora Welty, one of um, America's writers, a beautiful writer, southern writer. And it's about um, a man who is a robber in, on the Natchez Trace, and he's a uh, gentleman during the day and he robs at night. And my part was uh, uh, Rosamond Musgrove, and uh, she's out in the woods with her beautiful new clothes that her, her father has brought back, and uh, he comes and steals them from her. And she wants everything stolen from her, but he's not interested in that, so. She wants everything. Oh, yeah. She goes, what else are you taking? And then she takes a little pose. Oh, yeah. and she's naked, and he says, that's it. <laughs> I don't want anymore. So uh, she's left there naked. But in the meantime, my hair had been dropped, which was a blonde fall, so I was covered. And it was a funny scene, because they're doing a square dance right in the middle of the stage, and she has to make her way from downstage left across to downstage right. And they're going, where, oh, where is my baby darling? Where, oh, where is my baby darling? And she's right there, and she... <laughs> so it's a funny scene. The audience was relaxed about laughing, even though I was... Um, Not relaxed. Naked. Mm. <laughs> well, no, I got to I got to Thank God I was with people I'd been with for years. So the first time I took my... We had a class in group grope at Juilliard. So by the time I group took my... Group grope? Well... <laughs> <laughs> they were taking method acting a bit too far, well, isn't it? Well, <laughs> yeah, we always thought so too. But, but you know, it, it was to form a true ensemble. So we got to know every part of each other. <laughs> so when it came time for me to take off my clothes, they... Well, yeah, well, it's a yeah, right, big nothing. deal. <laughs> what's, what's the worst musical disaster you've been in? Well, um, it was a musical by Stephen Schwartz called The Baker's Wife, taken from the uh, film uh, La Femme de Boulanger. And um, as a matter of fact, there's a joke in theater that if Hitler were alive today, his punishment would be to send him out on the road in a musical in trouble. <laughs> Isn't that and right? It's, oh, it's dreadful. Really? Oh, it was six months of hell and six months where where 25-year uh, veterans would be crying on the phone to the general manager to get out of their contracts. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. it, was, it was quite disastrous. I... Uh, went into a state of catatonia when I went home and I lived in a blue robe for nine months. I slept, woke up, went to the refrigerator, ate, went back to sleep. I should bronze my blue robe, but I threw it out instead. <laughs> All right. You know, Mr. Aldrin, he used to be in musicals. I was, I was in the two. One, well, I was in one that only lasted for one and a half performances. They, they, uh, one they, and a half. The cops before. came in and stopped it. I mean, the cops <laughs> was came. Practically. It was just one of those disasters. You know what interests me, if I may ask, is you, you, you uh, sing and act so brilliantly both at the same time. Oh, and, and, and this is an opera you're in, and, and it's an eminently actable one. But I have seen a number of operas where the singers sang beautifully but acted like salamis, you know. <laughs> And, and, and I wonder, if is that because they're not trained, do you think, or is it because that, that, um, that a lot of opera is not actable? I mean, maybe is that no, the problem? No, there's so much opera that is actable. I think the problem is that the um, opera singers are concentrating specifically on the voice, yeah. and they don't allow themselves to listen to the text. See, I thank God that I had the acting training before I approached this role, because I was able to take the text apart make the points in the text and then yeah. the singing. But as a matter of fact, they were trying to teach the opera singers at Juilliard to approach the text as well as the, the notes, the score. Mm. But generally, they forget that. Well, we've got to take a break here. We'll be back in a moment to talk some more to Patti Lapone and the rest. Back in a moment. <laughs> Welcome back. My guests are Nalda, Thomas Keneally, and Patti Lapone. Patti. You've played this, this uh, part of Evita both here in Sydney and on, on Broadway. What's been the strongest reaction that you've had, audience reaction, to, to what you've done? Well, when, uh, uh, when we opened in Los Angeles, we had a pre-Broadway tour. Opening night, they had uh, the RSO people uh, 
bringing backstage certain people that were in the audience. So there was a certain amount of security. And uh, a woman uh, elbowed her way through the crowd and knocked people over and actually stunned people, screaming, Evita, Evita, Evita. And she was an Argentinian, and she was the daughter of Eva Zembalmer. And she Eva spoke- Eva Yes, she spoke no English. She was crying. She was hysterical. She saw me. She thought I was Eva Peron. She knew she had just seen a play. She knew that I was an actress portraying Evita Peron. But it didn't matter. Evita was still alive for her. And she was hysterical. Mm. She, she got through the crowd, which was amazing to everyone. And the RSO people were like, how? And everybody stopped. And she had the book. She thrust it into my gut, the book her father uh, had written and uh, touched me. And, uh, and then her husband came in, and, and she grabbed me, and they took tons of Polaroids. And then she was escorted out. But it was, um, it was an amazing Is that satisfactory as, the art as an artist, or is that spooky? Well, I don't think it was as much my performance as it was Evita's power in the world. Yeah. I, I really, in, in still in Argentina, actually, um, I've had many people come backstage that are pro-peronists, anti-peronists, and uh, they don't care. They love the fact that Evita is still alive on the stage. Mm. So it's, it's more th of her, I think she's manipulating the whole thing. There's an international revival around Evita Peron, you know? Yeah. Now what about, what about coming here to Australia, your very first time? Have you had have any problems here at all? Or things been... Well, no, no problems. It's been magical, which is an Australian phrase, and brilliant. We use brilliant in a different way, and much in a sparser, but here everything's brilliant. I love it, brilliant. <laughs> but yes, one night backstage, actually, the, the conductor came in and said, there's a deputy in the orchestra, and I went, geez, what'd we do wrong? Because deputy in America is, is a, a uh, well, the boss of the union, and I thought, oh, I'll behave, I'll do it. But here it's a substitute. It's a language problem, is it? You've got well, it's, it's the same language, it's so fascinating. It's the same language, and yet certain words mean different things. Like, my friend and I on our way over here, we were talking about the raging bull. Here, raging means go out and have a good time. We thought, did the Australians think it was the good time bull? Yeah. Right. <laughs> you got used to good day. Good day. Good day. Good day, mates. How are you? Baffled you when you when you first came. Good day. Good day. No, well, yes, especially at night. <laughs> this day. <is> <laughs> <laughs> good day, Patty. <laughs> what else have you got? Because you've got a book there, haven't you? Oh, you got I got great your... ones here. Yes, yeah, someone saw this little list that we were compiling in my dressing room and brought in dinkum oil, meanings and origins of things Aussies and Kiwis say. And, um, well, rave, you know, if you're a raving lunatic in America, you're nuts, but rave means talk here. Rage is another thing. Um, you go out and rage, and we have fits. Raging is a fit. <laughs> silly buggers. I love silly buggers. <laughs> That's a great one. She said, well, if you don't go act silly buggers, and I just, oh, wow. Well. <laughs> what, does, what does root mean in America? Well, <laughs> right, exactly. Root simply, I'll tell you later. Oh, yeah. right, no, but no, but root simply means, you know, root of a plant. Yeah. But here it yeah. has a couple of connotations. And <laughs> there's one I'd love to say on TV, but it's dirty. No. But, it, but the thing is, it, me, it has no emotional connotation to me at all as an American. It just sounds like there's a cleft palate. But here it's a curse. And, um... What is? Knoth? Knoth? Knoth. Knoth. No, no, no. The loves it. Must be dirty. If the no, no. band loves it, it's dirty. It's when you speak English and they say, what does that connote? And then it's just they were attempt to understand you. No, but it's connote. It? It's connote. Let's not get into it. No. No, no, no. <laughs> what about you, Thomas? Have you got a favorite Australian expression? Well, once again, they're ones that can't be repeated oh, they are, in, they? Uh, uh. in polite company. But, uh, <laughs> yes, uh, I, I like the Australian rhyming slang, like Joe Blake's. Everyone knows what a Joe Blake is in Australia. It's a snake. Um, there's a there's a very pithy um, one about uh, people who are ugly. I've often had people say it to me that you're. I, I can't say exactly what it is, but I'll use a Latinate word because they're less offensive somehow than um, Anglo-Saxon words. For some reason, coition is less 
is, is less offensive than another word, uh, which would cause a national scandal. If, uh, I'll use but, it. But, um, <laughs> There's a saying, he's as ugly as a hat full of fundaments. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I think that is, uh, that's a uh, fundament. <laughs> I think I know what that means. You yes. do. <laughs> they, don't, they don't always say fundaments. No, no, I'm sure they don't. Especially not in pubs. No, indeed not. Yeah. My favorite, I love crook. Crook's a great one. Oh, crook yeah. I'm feeling great. crook. Yeah. Yeah. What does it mean? Crook means, uh, it means, it can mean many things, actually, but it basically means ill. But it can mean an, another thing. Crook. A crook. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what would be the etymology of crook in that uh, um, context? I don't know. It just means ill. You know, there's Ill. no saying things are crook in Talarook. What, what does yeah. crook mean? <laughs> well, we don't have time to go into this. We'll, <laughs> we'll sit down and tell you all these things later. Dan, just one more question. How long are you going to be in Sydney for? Well, I'm doing a vita until August 15th, and then uh, my family and I are taking holiday here. Good. So I'll be here until the mid, mid September. With your little phrase book as well. No, for sure. Smash. All right. Miss <laughs> Patty Lepel, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Back in a moment, we'll close the show with Miss Teddy Vidal. See you tomorrow. Talk a bit tonight about the world of showbiz, and we leave you with the master's thoughts on it. The master, of course, was Noel Coward, and the song is his classic advice to stage truck mums Don't put your daughter on the stage, Mrs. Worthington. Giving it the treatment, Miss Kerry Bidell. <laughs> stage, Mrs. Worthington. Don't put your daughter on the stage. The profession is overcrowded and the struggle's pretty tough. And admitting the fact she's burning to act isn't quite enough. She has nice hands to give the wretched girl a due, but don't you think her bust is too developed for her age? I repeat, Mrs. Worthington, sweet Mrs. Worthington, don't put your daughter on the stage. Regarding your
teeth are fairly good. She's not the type I ever would be eager to engage. No more buts, Mrs. Worthington. Sage advice from Noel Card. My thanks to Kerry, to Alan Alder, to Thomas Keneally, and to Patty Lapone. To Channel 7 for the Evita clip. We'll see you the same time next week from all of us here. Until then, very good night. Good night. <laughs>